Vancouver. How's it going? Welcome back. This is another episode of Vancouver Real. My name is Mike Zaremba, and joining me always is my big brother, Andy Zaremba. Hey, Vancouver. And at the helm, it's Mr. Omed Pakbin. Mm, hello, everybody. And we're broadcasting or podcasting uh, from Float House down here in Gastown, Vancouver, BC, at 70 West Cordova Street. Float House is a uh, nine tank sensory deprivation and flotation center. If you're not too familiar with what floating is, go check out our website, floathouse.ca. And if you use the promo code RECOVERY, you can save yourself 20% off a single float. Uh, we also always want to plug Omega Point YouTube channel, which mm -hmm. is Omid's uh, creation and, and little baby brainchild. Yeah, that's, uh, that's the word. That's a Thank good you. One. Yeah. His brainchild, which is uh, a YouTube channel which has some really inspirational videos. And I understand you're, you're creating um, another video based off our last podcast with Dr. Gabor Mate. Mm -hmm. So really excited to hear that. What, what part of that podcast you chose to select for your video is going to be exciting. And we'll definitely share that uh, within our streams as well when it's released. And uh, moving on to today's guest, kind of in line with the theme of Dr. Gabor Mate and uh, some of the festivities that are happening here in Vancouver in the next couple of weeks is Mr. Sobi Wing. And when I was trying to do some research, you don't have a website that I could find per, like specified for yourself or anything like that. So I'm trying to piece things together of what you do and who you are, um, but you're gonna have to help us fill in some of the blanks, but sure. you're a DJ, um, you, you are a speaker, you work at the, uh, the Urban Shaman, and I'm not sure what your position is there, but I want to get into that as well, which is an ethnobotanical um, shop here in, uh, in Gastown as well. Um, you speak at like the Spirit Plant Medicine Conference, festivals, uh, you did a TEDx uh, talk in 2011 with the Georgia Strait, and you seem to kind of revolve around the themes of, um, well, rites of passage for one, indigenous cultures, uh, dance culture, electronic dance culture, and how that's kind of, uh, there's a movement behind that with a uh, spiritual awakening even. Um, and the do one documentary I saw from you was the electronic awakening that you were in as well. Um, themes of spirituality and also entheogens and psychedelics. So there's a lot of things to cover here and uh, hopefully you can help bring some clarity to us. But first of all, thanks for coming on and welcome Mr. Sobi Wing, appreciate it. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Cool. And I, I like to also begin by just acknowledging the territory we're on, unceded Coast Salish territory. And uh, I've lived here for about half my life, grew up in Toronto. And um, yeah, it's been an amazing place to to center my my life. And yeah. So what was the territory you said we were on here? This is unceded Coast Salish territory. So uh, the city of Vancouver um, has, in this past year, acknowledged that this is unceded territory. It was never um, given over to the, the Canadian government. So it, uh, it remains as it was <clears throat> um, for thousands of years, maybe 10,000 years, mm. um, a territory that uh, has a longstanding history and culture. and. Um, so now the city is actually um, working towards conducting its city affairs in in agreement and in uh, consultation with the, the the local First Nations. So it's a historic precedent um, tied in with the other national uh, reconciliation movement to uh, address the historical trauma of the residential schools across the country. And um, so this is a move in that direction. So I think it's important to, to acknowledge that and it's, it's becoming a custom in, in city affairs and also in the types of events that go on around, around the city. And I've seen it spreading also in Toronto as well. And um, it's, you know, it's also significant in that the name Vancouver is the name of an of a explorer who came here who, un unbeknownst to most people who live here or people who have heard the word Vancouver is, you know, there's a, a, a history associated with how he came here and the, the effect he had on the people here involving, you know, bloodshed. And um, it's not, to me, it's, it's, it's important that we, as, as a relatively young city, 
uh, come to know the history of, of the land that we live upon a little further, and especially in light of the, the threats that are facing our, our West Coast in terms sure. of the, the Salish Sea being threatened by oil tankers and that the, the front line of defense is the, uh, the First Nations people. And it's really a historical time, I think, for us to uh, <clears throat> acknowledge their people and, and stand in, in support of them. So um, I think that'll tie into a lot of the things we could talk about today. Sure, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I, as this, um, obviously, I'm, I'm very sure you're aware of the Oppenheimer Park uh, tent city that was just recently mm-hmm. taken down, actually, a couple days ago. Yeah, um, which was kind of was this, uh, and I'd, I'd never dug into that story too too much, but I'm assuming that this is uh, uh, related to what you're speaking of right now. Yeah, I went over there um, a few weeks back, <clears throat> and um, um, yeah, one of the significant things about that that camp was that they had um, elders and um, um, uh, sacred fire kept and an an arbor set up and daily um, prayers and uh, also like um, protocols being enacted there that related to the the sovereign um, governance structures and so part of what was going on there was they were um, uh, operating within you know their own uh, territorial um sovereign rights and so that i think changed the the dynamic of it being simply some squatters taking mm-hmm. over to you know this this is actually you know reclaiming of territory and um i know that for the it's that area is known as japan town and so you know i know the japanese culture there they um the community there um had this interaction with the the First Nations people there, and it was really um, from a place of solidarity, of understanding what it's like to be displaced, to have their their neighborhood or their area being kind of taken up by you know settlers or people that came in from elsewhere. So there's interesting kind of interplay going on there, and <clears throat> um, but yeah, I think you know that's a huge issue around the. The number of homeless people that's been growing versus the number of um, unoccupied uh, real estate in our city. And it's heartening to hear that um, people who are in the COPE um, running for election are, are looking at things like taxing people that keep empty uh, houses. You know, if they can afford to do that, then they can contribute towards helping resolve the homeless situation in our city. So it's an interesting time that we're looking at in terms of creating solutions for our growing population. Yeah, what do you, and so from your interpretation, and uh, maybe you know closer since you were at the Oppenheimer Park, or Oppenheimer Park recently, um, what was their goal? And what, w- what were they trying to, uh, was it more just to kind of start the conversation a little more abruptly, or was it, uh, were they actually, um, you know, like, what was the kind of take-home message that they're trying to send with the whole, with that whole ceremonial kind of approach? Well, I wouldn't want to speak for them. Um, I guess what I could say is um, that I know, I know that other um, Native people from out of out of the region, you know, came in solidarity and looked at what they were doing as another. Just another example of resistance of like, you know, um, we as Vancouverites might and settlers might take for granted that this is just, you know, this is just a city that we just live in. Whereas for people who have, um, you know, a more uh, native based history and knowledge of their, their history, you know, it would be a little different to look at. So any kind of occurrence where there's, you know, um, a show of so- uh, sovereignty being enacted becomes significant. Um, and, you know, the other issues that the media might try to spin around it in terms of, you know, um, 
the dangers and the threats and the things that make it unpleasant to to have in a neighborhood, uh, which are all you know social issues that are present regardless. Mm-hmm. Um, and the, what's, what was different there is that there was definitely a community pulling together, and I th- you know I think there's still that you know for for a lot of those people. They don't get that when they're just sort of scattered into their their um, they're trying to survive on a regular day to day. But at least they're you know they had meals being prepared, they had donations coming in, they had people helping each other, and a set of agreements to to create um, some kind of harmonious coexistence. So in terms of the value of that, I think that's something that surpasses probably the paid services that are out there mm-hmm. um, but uh, at the same time it's a, it's I, I know that they were doing um, a, a public call for it, for just dealing with the issues of homelessness and and you know it's a big message right there yeah can you maybe share with us a bit of your your background because um, like I said before the podcast with you have kind of uh, uh, on seeing your presence online in different circles, and I guess you know that's the, the one thing about social media is the the ability to kind of um, poke your head in different social circles, um, you know, relatively anonymously and virtually, and and just take note of them, right? And that's how I became familiar with you. And I don't even I remember I added you to Facebook a while ago, but um, and. Can you just maybe tell us, like you said, you came from Toronto, but how did you kind of get involved with with the things that you are involved with? Maybe you can clarify some of those that you're willing to share. Yeah, um, I grew up in um, Toronto and I guess um, had um, in my early, early 20s um, more of a community based in the sort of social justice uh, arena um, and anti-racism um, and I guess when I moved to Vancouver I started um, being exposed to a little more of the electronic music culture and um, a more celebratory kind of uh, way of community um, but there wasn't really um, the same level of uh, community participation beyond just like, you know, celebration. And um, some of my um, pe- people that I was involved in that time included people like uh, G.K. Leung, who um, you may have seen at the Engage, uh, he put together the Engage event, um, who were also part of that sort of uh, anti-racist kind of uh, activist kind of scene and um, saw the potentials of creating, you know, this kind of place where people could model, you know, alternative ways of, of approaching reality and life and in this sort of general unhealthy state as it is, um, and, and bring up um, that direction into um, creating social change. And it was, um, or the period from, I'd say, the late 90s to the mid 2000s, um, we saw a lot of uh, interesting, this is before, I guess, the, the large scale festivals began to emerge, which are common now. Like what? Which ones are those? Um, you know, this was like before the dawn of Shambhala Festival, and, right. which is kind of the pinnacle uh, large scale festival of BC. Um, there was basically more. Uh, couple hundred people gatherings and a lot more frequency of doing things in a sort of low-key renegade style where it's like let's go out and enjoy this beautiful like mountain region over here in Squamish let's go to the beach over here or let's you know um, that quickly became unsustainable with with more and more interest in those kind of things just having that experience and um, but Within that time period, there was a lot of, uh, you know, kind of bringing in um, elements of intentional community and uh, um, utilizing um, tools like council and um, 
like sitting in in a circle and and having uh, tools of counsel and creating equal opportunity for people to share and express and bringing in workshops into uh, a combination with a dance event and a little bit of um, exploring the edges around creating a sort of sense of ceremony um, definitely being inspired by a lot of different cultures, indigenous cultures and mystical uh, Eastern cultures. And of course, we've seen that really blossom in terms of the yoga kind of um, and healing arts kind of practices that are going on. But, you know, back then it was really, you know, on the cusp. And it, it yeah, was and what, so of, what are you uh, talking about? Like what time frame are we looking at? Um, yeah, the, like the late 90s into the early 2000s, I guess. Mm -hmm. Um, we do retreats, which are still on, going on today, called Intention, um, and have in, that over the New Year's period. So instead of this sort of debauchery kind of way of starting the year, yeah. it was actually coming together with people that felt like really safe to be around, really like-minded, really heart-centered people, and creating like a more clear vision of what, what do I want to make this year about mm -hmm. and um, that really inspired me in the direction things like that things like earth dance which was a yearly has been a yearly um, thing I've been involved with organizing for 13 years but going for 18 years the whole global dance for peace um, and and enacting this sort of uh, prayer for peace uh, once a year so these kind of things um, I guess kind of opened me up to, along with my own heritage being, you know, um, partly uh, from the Visayas, from the Philippines, and recovering my understanding of what that culture was before colonization and just how deeply connected with the earth it was and seeing a way to kind of approximate some sort of um, e eco-spiritual based community within the context of celebration, touching upon elements of healing and activism, uh, that all became sort of my line of, of work, you could say. Mm -hmm. So even if I wasn't making my direct living off of it, the people I was working amongst were those people, were those people that were like, hey, I'll help you find some work to, to get you through because I see what you're doing, helping create this space for for more community types of events and um, and now it's led me onto my own personal path of of focusing on supporting transition and and times of change so when it started off it was kind of solstices and equinoxes new years and now um, i've been looking at the astrological um, transits that occur in people's lives that are kind of like our universal story of unfolding into our full potential um, that happen with things like the Jupiter return, the Saturn return, the Uranus opposition, um, but also times of like, you know, just um, trauma, addiction, um, any kind of major change. I've seen the power of community to uh, support those kind of moments which if done in a way that's useful can actually um, greatly enhance the the effects of that that transition in a positive direction mm -hmm. um, and some of my community um, that started off in the dance community got involved in working with addiction through the iboga therapy house which used to happen on the sunshine coast so for a couple of years, I was I was engaged in that work. Is and, it still uh, in operation? Uh, no, not not that. But there are currently um, s some new, newer, and new emerging uh, providers of iboga in this in this region. And iboga, it's it's uh, legal in Canada. Is that correct? Yeah, it's legal. Yeah, and so um, it's good to hear that these things are being used in a proactive manner. And then so. Coming from that kind of synopsis you gave us, what is the current state um, of this community, like these types of communities, and what, what are the kind of the pillar events that happen throughout a year 
Um, mm. You know, uh, is, is, are things growing? Is it stagnant? Is it uh, has it shifting? Well, of course, there's a lot of fluctuation and and different um, kind of directions that the community will go, which is all in a in a good sense, you know, I think it leads to a diversity of approach. And so some people have been working towards um, creating uh, an eco-spiritual based community um, site on the Sunshine Coast at a place called Ruby Lake Resort. And uh, I'm not sure of the current status of that. Um, there's, uh, there's potentials of um, a new festival I can't really talk too much about quite yet, but um, we could be seeing some new f types of festivals that we haven't seen before emerging that would really, in my mind, be you know modeling um, the values that are currently reflecting the most um, transformational kind of direction that we could be going. Um, there's also, uh, you know, this spirit plant medicine kind of community that has many different varieties of groups from ayahuasca to ibogaine to peyote um, and you know um, you know this coming week actually is the next um, spirit plant medicine conference and you're so, speaking uh, at that this year, right? Um, I'm not speaking at that. I'm actually doing a lead-in event on oh. Wednesday, the 22nd, at Eternal Abundance okay. in partnership with Conscious Living Network. And it's going to be a t talking stick circle. So it'll be a chance for people to um, have an equal chance to share their, their input on a variety of questions and themes that surround the whole ceremonial use of uh, spirit plant medicines and entheogens. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, for people that like maybe aren't familiar with these types of um, festivals and circles and experiences, but maybe are curious, what, where, do you, where would you kind of recommend they get more information and um, how can they get more involved? Um, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, there... Uh, has become sort of a central channeling of everything into Facebook, which uh, you know is unfortunate in a sense for the Vancouver and surrounding region because we, I was part of Tribal Harmonics, which was uh, I guess one of the ways of naming that community I was talking about in the late nine, uh, late nineties to early two thousands, and. Um, we had a, a community website before social media really took off. So a good way to really create a container for that um, formation of community. And, and now there is quite a few people that know each other um, spread out from like all over the place, not just locally. Um, but there isn't sort of a, a way to, to harness all that potential. But um, recently I've been really tuning in to the the broader network of especially West Coast uh, event producers and people affiliated with those um, networks. And the talk is that, you know, within this year or two, uh, we're going to see a whole host of different varieties of hub sites and places to really shift away from Facebook into um, um, places where there can be a, a, a much heightened much more heightened degree of collaborative um, right. focus. So you see, do you feel Facebook is kind of like, it's good content shadowed amongst the sea of not necessarily good content kind of thing? Yeah, I mean, I've certainly used it as a, as a formidable tool and it's done quite considerable things. Sure. Um, but considering um, the types of things that could happen in terms of creating uh, land-based communities, in terms of creating more webs of um, social enterprise and community currency, etc. cetera. Um, it's too, too challenging to make that happen on Facebook. And also it's a, it's a, it's a medium that's subject to sudden change and potential, um, you know, with the whole NSA um, 
lack of privacy, you know, becomes a place where certain t levels of conversation don't feel safe to happen there. Right. And um, it's important that I think privacy be a, a value that goes into any kind of uh, work that people do just to, yeah. to safeguard, you know, for the future because we just don't know. So you're talking about creating different hubs, like different websites, different things like that. Is, is that what you mean by different yeah. hubs? Because like, in terms of NSA monitoring anything on the internet, they could easily monitor those as well, most likely. Yeah, but I think in terms of uh, where you want to host your um, collection of databases and resources and whatnot, I think it just makes sense to make it on a platform where people trust the people that host it and, you know, there's a sense right. of... Uh, Versus the mega corporation of something else or something. Yeah, I mean, I guess um, one of the examples that sort of lingers is the, the tribe.net, which was uh, one of the early social media platforms that really drew out the, uh, I guess, alternative-minded networks, um, lar largely because of the Burning Man community. And everybody got on there. It was the first time where people were really feeling the power of social media to be able to bring together people, especially who are kind of alternative-minded. And then, you know, the 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 direction of that, that uh, site really... Um, you know, the, it, it just went in a corrupt direction and didn't really, and then brought ground to a, a standstill where the, you know, it's just clunking and not actually functioning in a way that anybody would want to bother with. So it's um, another example of, you know, yeah. Don't. Have you personally been to there. Burning Man? Uh, I've been, yes, like eight times. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, because there's a documentary that's been recent that came out this year on Netflix about kind of the behind the scenes of Burning Man and how it's definitely morphed into and kind of gives a, a bit, I mean, at least I don't know what uh, what angle of their whole history, like the story behind it. But, it, you know, I had no idea that it's now such a it's like a well-oiled machine almost, you know what I mean? It's very organized. Um, and I think it's probably had to, was forced into that direction just, just by the sheer volume and metrics that they're dealing with. Mm -hmm. um, what's, in your opinion, do you think it's changed from like its essence or do you think it's been able to retain kind of what it was originally intended to be about? I think anything that grows to the scale of Burning Man, you know, we're talking about over 50,000, 60,000 people will be compromised in its ability to retain its um, ability to, to stay responsive to, to community held values. Um, there's a lot of loyalty to the brand and to the, to the, the, the Burning Man community that I think is is good um but i mean i think the uh the larger promise for me is in the regionals and the work that's going on in the regionals because that's really where people live and it's year round and it, you know it all lands on the playa at some point too so it happens there too mm -hmm. um but even here in vancouver you know um the the uh the Vancouver Burning Man community is sitting on a lot of resources from the success of their events and and is even, you know, trying to figure out where they can put the benefit of that. So um, I I think that it's, it's a good place to spark um, people's, you know, epiphanies or you know, sense of possibility about what, what they could do, how they could offer their gifts and find like-minded people. I know, you know, so many people there come from small towns in Midwest, Middle America or whatever that, you know, because of their going to Burning Man, they're changing their, those, those kind of Bible Belt kind of areas, you know, yeah. and that's, that's really good, you know. Yeah. No, like the whole, um, festival culture is really foreign to me. Like I know the word Shambhala, I've heard of it, but that's really all I know about it. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, partially, you're talking about creating these separate communities online and things like that. 
um, and you're kind of talking about getting off of Facebook and off of that mainstream platform. Well, wouldn't that kind of more hinder like the kind of movement that you're going towards as opposed to help it? Because if you're not reaching a bigger and more mainstream audience, how are you going to change things? Yeah, I mean, I think it's leveraging the, the benefit from and shifting it over um, as it's ready. Like, you know, we saw the, the attempt to do that prematurely with the, that whole Elo um, platform. There was this big wave of people jumping over there, but they weren't actually ready to do much, you know? And so. I'm not familiar. What is this? What was it? Uh, Elo, it's called. E L L O. I didn't even hear. I must have Neither missed it completely. Oh, yeah. No. What was um, it trying to do, or what was it? Uh, well, there was this scare because um, Facebook, which they later apologized about, you know, made a deal about people having false names for their profile, mm -hmm. um, and really um, struck the um, the uh, distaste of the lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgendered community. Because for them, it was a way of you know um, having that ability to 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 change their their name is a way of um, protecting them from persecution and things like that. So um, that that really stung and caused this whole um, move of people towards that, and that caught caught on for. I guess you guys didn't hear about it, but yeah, there was for a couple of weeks. Is this re was it this year? Yeah, it was just within a you know past month or so. Oh wow! Okay, cool. I, me <clears throat> I remember hearing about Facebook making some sort of reference towards people using their real names on on their accounts and their profiles and stuff. And yeah, I that didn't follow the trail much because that always gets swallowed into uh, float house stuff here. But yeah. Um, I wanted to uh, talk a bit about, because you, you've done talks online, and I'm not sure how much you're engaged with it right now, but in terms of like rites of passage, um, you seem to have focused on this a little bit, and maybe just kind of generally explain why that is, and, and what, mm -hmm. what, you, uh, what you kind of maybe hope to accomplish by discussing this topic. Yeah, it's, um, it's something that emerged for me um, through the creating of um, ceremonies to mark the, the solstices and the New Year's. And um, I saw how, how much um, it feels like we're crying out for that, you know, in terms of uh, the average person when they come in contact with it. You know, I think that's for some people, going to Burning Man is a rite of passage. You know, it signals a transition into a completely different way of being and lifestyle. But for other people, it might be, um, you know, that change might come from um, leaving the corporate world, you know, and going towards their, you know, this deep-held passion they've had since they were young to really express um, something that's inside of them like you know an artistic uh, gift or a, you know wanting to help people or something that matches some some deeply held value and um, I think that that caused me to look deeper and and you know before I even knew what a rite of passage was I guess I was kind of um, looking at this and then when I came across the whole terminology which um, is an anthropological eth ethnography term that this uh, Belgian guy named Charles Arnold Van Gennep uh, coined um, he was he was pointing out that um, as he observed it in societies and this was all during the time of the new world um, the new world you know for the Europeans it was a new world that they were exploring and seeing all these like incidences of like some sort of ceremony happening and what was going on was that people were it was like the glue that was um, the discernible thing that brought those communities into deep bonds with each other and you know of course the big ones being you know death rights um, birth rights and um, unions between families and clans, weddings, um, births, and births, namings, and um, you know these are the times when people really 
tap into the lifeblood of what's going on in their in their their culture and their community you know who's who and who who does what and um so i was getting a small taste of that just through you know these little gatherings we were doing <clears throat> but then when i looked at it in in the in the larger scheme of things i was seeing this is and i'm not alone in, in making the observation but it, it, this is what's really going wrong in today's modern world is that we've drifted from these closely held bonds of of trust and support and saying i'll be there for you when it's that time to this one where it's like um if i can afford to pay for the help i can get some help you know and um this more moving into this sort of isolation and competition and scarcity and fear that there's not enough and um not this whole spirit of sharing you know and um so when i looked at my political aspirations of what kind of society i would want to live in my spiritual aspirations of what kind of way that i would want to uh, live in or potentially raise family in you know i just saw that um, these are the, the things that we need to center in more on and so i began exploring offering um, ceremonies with individuals and and in many cases it's with people who have zero kind of um, lineage or family kind of support of that nature and so um, it's a kind of a rebuilding and re-educating and re-inspiring around that whole concept of um, if I create uh, a focal point for this transition that I'm going through because like, a person knows when they're going through a change and they can either um, try to shield themselves or hide the fact or they can face it head on and and potentially receive the benefit of it be be moved by that current in a new direction yeah I, I would even question that a little bit of how how conscious people are to recognize that they are going through an intense change and i think that's when you see people go into these you know more traumatic unconscious uh Mm. Unconscious transitions where they, you know, just for a crude, crude example, the uh, midlife crisis or something like that, you know, or or a teenager doing something to make herself or himself feel better about just how, that they are changing and they're like, you know, and I think that's, uh, I'm sure some people are kind of aware of it. I think a lot of people aren't even aware of it at all. You know, like, well, you so it, we're uh, so drifted from that point. It's yeah. like um, a good chunk of people aren't aware of it. I think they, they may not be aware of it, but I think we're familiar with the whole way that um, people, in the absence of a conscious initiation, there's the self-initiation that they'll do. So they'll do something for themselves that maybe is like a great ordeal um, that could be, you know, taking a huge risk, you know, doing something really that could be life or death. Um, just putting it all on the line and, you know, making maybe sometimes not so wise de decisions. And um, it could also be that uh, people are um, coming from a place of trauma and then, you know, they, they build onto that trauma ways to cope with that. And that could involve things like addiction, which, you know, transitions them into a whole other kind of reality. And so that I regard as, you know, um, a rite of passage, potentially in a negative way, mm -hmm. and then a positive if they come out of it. I, I was kind of uh, thinking about this before the podcast about, you know, what are kind of like, if you didn't say, like what are contemporary mainstream rites of passage in our culture? And a couple that I was thinking of was like uh, somebody going to university you know, and they go to university because they're living, they're moving away from home and they're like amongst uh, their peers and, you know, they're being educated, but also, you know, they're being exposed to, I mean, I, I think the, the numbers of uh, university students that, you know, party pretty hard with, with alcohol and, and those types of things. And, you know, that's like the prestigious rite of passage, you know, oh, go on to university and get that education. And, you know, it, it's... 
and and granted like i went through that path for sure you know i definitely uh have changed a lot since then but and will always change but um that uh com and, and then the other ones i was thinking of was like maybe um sports teams and like going through uh these little micro tests within a, a community of a, of a team of that sort but beyond those things i didn't really come up with a lot you know and 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 those uh two avenues at this time in my life i look at them relatively superficially you know uh, i look at i mean you can get you can learn lessons from life and and uh, attributes of persistence and cooperation and teamwork and, and stuff like that from different sporting events. But I think they, those, those attributes can be gained in other ways, you know, for sure. And, um, you know, in your mind, what do you think are uh, good uh, points to have in a rites of passage? You know, what, what makes mm -hmm. up a good rite of passage? Um, is it things about like, putting someone to a test you know like so they can prove something to themselves that they maybe didn't know they were even capable of is it the act of creation of something mm -hmm. um, i don't know what do you, in your mind what do you think can, can makes up a good rite of passage what different components yeah well <clears throat> with the uh, the i guess the understanding of the distinctions between i guess different types of transitions a person might go through um I'd say there are some some ones that I consider pretty key, which <coughs> include things like uh, the witnessing aspect. And a quote that um, I like to repeat is the the quote that the wound that isn't witnessed does not heal. And that's uh, I believe from Rumi, and I believe also is a tenant of allopathic medicine, and. Um, which is why when people are able to to share what's going on in their in their suffering, what they're going through, um, if they feel like the person's actually listening to them and being a human being with them, something begins to start moving right away. So I think um, <clears throat> that ideally, you know, would be from the the circle of of people that are close to you in your life, you know. And um, it's a symptom of that need being there when people end up going to, you know, professionals and strangers for that, that that's something that, that would, have, would be of benefit to them. Um, so that could happen, you know, um, before they go into a rite of passage. It could happen during, it could happen after. Um, but especially after, I'd say, is, is you know, a time where um, if people don't feel like they can share what they've been through, like that ordeal, that testing, um, I think that can result in, you know, a person feeling sometimes um, overwhelmed and like they're carrying something so heavy that it's, it's just like they feel like they're um, different than everyone, you know, that, they, that they're, they're not like everyone and so they feel um, perhaps like an abnorm abnormality and they'll start behaving from that place. So I think uh, <clears throat> that's, that's something that could be instead, you know, um, a place where people learn, you know, what did, what did you experience? Um, what was your, you know, in terms of the language of uh, Joseph Campbell and the, the hero's journey that is often the way of looking at a rite of passage, you know, what is the boon or the gift that you received and how do you place that within um, your community or the world? Um, that's where I think you, you, we see the fruit of it. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's what needs to happen more as other people see that fruit that leads to more people wanting to share in that experience. Um, if you take a large scale example of that um, as a whole society, I like that example of uh, Eleusius, which was the Greek um, center of initiation at, at the peak of its civilization, you know, and yeah. it was a place where every citizen within Greece was 
in a way expected to go and experience the mysteries of what it was whatever was in that uh, initiation and yeah. to even reveal it was to you know you you would suffer death for that that's how powerful that that mystery was mm -hmm. but um <clears throat> it became a shared reference point for everybody who did it so it's something that um yeah it's something that i think having just that basic understanding that these things are important i think is an important thing for society as a whole because then we can start to filter that into our types of leadership that we have our types of governance systems that we have and um, the ways that we treat health and every aspect yeah yeah what you're saying it, it seems very idealistic you know and we have a huge population of people on this planet six billion people i don't see how we can possibly you know have a lot of the luxuries we have with like good health care you know high quality of living uh high quality food despite what a lot of people say uh, you know people live longer now than they ever have in, in history you know um and it, it seems I, I don't know it seems kind of problematic to uh, want people to go back to like a tribal type of society in a sense you know i think responsibility kind of falls on the individual for creating the kind of life that you want to create and if you want to be responsible taking care of your family your immediate family like you know don't put your parents in a home you know take care of them before you do something like that you know live in a multi-generational household and start start on that kind of level mm -hmm. you know um to reorganize society in such a way that would be like well now we go into this kind of tribalistic mentality I, I just don't see how that's possible and i don't either you know i don't i don't think um it's about creating this uniform way of how everybody experiences it. And, you know, one of the, the uh, recent um, movements that I've tapped into, well, it's, it's been going on for, say, 30, 40 years, but that I've recently tapped into is the, the Youth uh, roots, Rites of Passage movement, um, which, uh, you know, began to conceptualize a more modern approach to creating initiation rights particularly for for youth and you know that con considerably um, volatile period could have such huge benefit because you know what happens at youth can become the can set the bar for like you know how people go for the rest of their life you know and what they pass on to their you know children at that stage and how their children are going to look after them when they're old, you know. So there's this kind of way of passing on from generation to generation. And I've heard it said um, by a First Nations um, colleague in the Rites of Passage field um, that, you know, if you have a, a culture or a community that has seven generations layered of, you know, intact um, connection, you know, you have a very resilient culture. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's the kind of goal that I think would be a good thing to think about is this whole seven generations uh, kind of philosophy of, of indigenous cultures. <clears throat> it's something that I think all of us can really benefit from is just how are we going to create a legacy that, you know, makes sure that there's something for, for future life to to be able to to draw upon and um what's interesting in this this movement um the organization is called youth passageways and uh, we have all these different groups that we've come to know and some of them are engaging it from you know um people that are youth that are incarcerated or coming out of jail <clears throat> coming out of jail to people that are like you know um ivy league you know really um swimming in in wealth and that kind of thing but the principles that <clears throat> are in common around you know that kind of support and accountability and you know this desire to become the adult that you want to be you know um living with your own individual purpose all of those kind of things 
lend themselves to just this general direction i think of let's let's bring the let's bring this global culture into a state of maturity like where are we at right now you know some people would say well we're we're kind of in this terminal it seems like a terminal adolescence or it could end up that way so it's like mm-hmm. but then there's those parts that are moving forward and and trying to you know, go through that growing pain yeah one thing we were talking about the other day actually we were talking about the corporation and how you know how much these big corporations now have influence and so much influence over the government you know and uh, how it's not necessarily the size that's the problem more it is that the consciousness of the people that are leading these corporations you know if they were a lot more socially responsible uh, I think that would be a way to um, create the positive change that we actually need in different ways and that and that really changes you know from the individual level and how do you reach those people how do you how do you change somebody um who you know who is so set in their ways and wants to make their income and doesn't want to regress to a, a, a different way of life you know and i think you know things like some of the rites of passages like you were saying could be a great way of doing that psychedelic experiences could be a way of doing that um, and I think just changing the overall consciousness of, I forget of people, essentially. Where I heard this, and it was this recent, and I, I, I completely forget, but it just stuck with me, was like, don't try to change your parents, change your children. And obviously that's mm. kind of getting at, like, and us being in the age of the information revolution that we're in, it's information. It's, it's opening up. Uh, conversations and discussions and ideas that there are different ways to live a life and there's actually an infinite way of living a life and and uh, to not just be um, you know absorbed by what the popular culture is uh, is is out there and being presented to people with I think that um, I think that this stage of our adolescence right now is kind of the stage of accumulating sharing and um, just discussing wisdom and truth in different ways and, and however that might resonate with different people. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and that's where it kind of starts, you know, and then it, it, having <clears throat> ideas conveyed to a younger population and that way within the generations to come, like I see social change personally, and this is something I've just been kind of understanding more myself, that it's, it's, it's a slow progress. It's a, it's a slow change. I, I, you know, I don't see this drastic you know like i was definitely very entertained not entertained is a bad word but just um into the whole occupy movement Mm -hmm. and uh, how quickly that came about and i'm like i was like holy shit you know everyone's gonna go join this and the economy's gonna collapse and all this stuff and uh, you know like because you saw this this mass rush towards it um although it was still you know significantly a small amount of people relative to the whole population but you just you just saw it all across the world and in, in, in that regard and um, I see social change happening on a, just a slower level than you know and that's I think as a human being who's alive for 70 80 or 90 years that perception of time uh, for me it, it's starting to shift you know it's like you you do what you can within your time but also recognize that big scale change takes uh it takes time you know yeah well things like occupy <clears throat> and i don't know more arab spring you know i you know those are wake up calls right you know and those are the things that happen when you know things reach a certain critical mass of, or a critical point where things are just like people are just like hitting the wall right and we're seeing that every year now like because of social media especially we're seeing more and more varieties of the same story Ukraine. of how like you know the again this sort of global maturity thing where it's like going from the me to the we and this whole like um you know identification with this is my possession this is my land this is my security in my future versus this like how do we make it work for everybody and um you know i think that those wake-up calls are places that we can strategically almost like center upon you know we can seize upon those times and say like okay what does that 
how do we place the energy of that thing that swelled up, that <clears throat> volcan volcanic energy, how do we take that and like make it um, something attainable within you know, a short term period that goes into a longer lasting kind of change. And, um, you know, another example <clears throat> to make it a little more um, within the, the grasp of any person living on this planet is, you know, we all are going to die. And that is another wake up call for a lot of people as you know, and often before we get there, uh, we've spent how many how many minutes even thinking about it, you know? Yeah. Something that is inev inevitable. It's it's something that we usually put off for as long as we can until it smacks us in the head. And, you know, one of the things that is happening with the rites of passage world is um, changing the, the approach to that whole pivotal part of the life cycle so that by that time, um, people are not suffering as isolated elderly people mm -hmm. but are actually you know experiencing a chance to pass on their life experience their story the things they learned the resources they tapped onto you know other generations to yeah. become mentors yeah. to become and i think that's so important and that's something that it's actually become on my radar for the past few months for sure about trying to figure out how I could arrange my family unit to have, you know, my parents live in the same house as me one day or and even my, you know, my significant other's parents living in the same house and and living in that multi-generational household. And how do you even make that work in a city like Vancouver when to, jet, to buy a house is going to cost you like two and a half million dollars or whatever it's going to cost you, you know. Um, but I think, uh, you know, honoring like the elderly for one is a huge one, you know. Um, not just shoving them away in the home like mm -hmm. i don't know in fact this is quite personal but we had an email from our aunt because we have a grandfather in toronto who's in a home and you know now he, he we just found out in the email that he's like suffering from depression you know and he's you know getting older he's 94 and of course there's a lot of health ailments and things coming up at this point but uh, it would have been so much nicer for him to not have to to in a sense kind of be isolated in that way but at the same time we don't have the means to physically take care of him, you know, and, that, and that's kind of speaking to the broken nature of things, you know, like we can't, we have to go out and earn a living, we have to pay our mortgages, you know, uh, to have that place to live. Um, so, you know, to have, you know, we have to go out and make money to support our lifestyle, but well, how do you get someone, you know, but we couldn't afford to have like a, a caretaker at home living with him and, yeah. well, I you mean, know. that's, I mean, that's, that's, is it possible or is it not possible? I don't, I don't know. I mean, no, we never really had formally sat down and crunched the numbers or all that kind of stuff to figure out if it actually is possible or not, yeah. you know what I mean? But, and, you know, and just kind of touching on the notion of death and, and that part of our culture that we, you know, we're very, I don't even know what we are with it. We're just completely alien to it, really. Um, and, and I got another personal comment about that is uh, our, our one grandmother, when she passed away, um, our dad was the only one that was willing to be at her bedside when she actually departed, you know, mm, like her, yeah. her, her husband and her, her daughter and her other son, just for maybe personal fear reasons. I don't know they why I wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't be able to be at the bedside at the person at the time she's departing. And that story really struck me, and more so now. Like when I reflect yeah. on that, I'm like, man, like, well, that's what, you know, I put yourself I, in that position, right? And you're, you're, whether you're conscious or not, just what would you hope would be the scenario? And that I, ideally, you're surrounded scenario. by your loved ones when you're passing, right? right? Uh, you know, and one thing, I, I worked at a hospital for a few years, and I knew a lot of nurses, and they would say that most people actually die alone. Most mm -hmm. people die alone. And in fact, nurses aren't even comfortable being in the room when somebody dies. And a lot of times when they know that process is happening, they just leave. And you die alone, you know? So how do we change that i mean uh, everyone's so fearful of death but it's such an irrational fear if you really think mm -hmm. about it you know it's going to happen it's inevitable uh and what is the fear it's you know the loss of your sense of self saying i'm not going to exist anymore you know in this mm -hmm. body that my ego is going to die i'm not going to be here 
Yeah. Um, how do you change people's fear of that? Well, I don't, I don't know. I mean, oh, that's, I think that's that where a lot comes with ego death and that kind of thing and mm-hmm. realizing that your body is an impermanent thing and will eventually dissolve into what it came from. And, um, you know, and, and we could kind of reprogram people essentially to not fear that, but almost embrace it and almost even celebrate it. You know, think how much nicer of a way that would be for somebody who is in that state to be surrounded by people almost like celebrating you as you go, as you pass on. It can change mm-hmm. the whole culture around death, essentially. Yeah. yeah, there's a movement that's been kind of called the conscious dying um, kind of movement. And uh, people like Ram Das and people like that have, uh, you know, put the, uh, the connection between like things like meditation you know, um, to 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 it to bring that into the practice, like to actually consider death as your final practice. You know, sure. that we prepare for. You don't have to wait till you're going to die. You can, you know. Sure. And you know, even when we go into meditation, I've had that experience sometimes where I just feel like it's kind of a. I've had that overwhelming moment. I had it actually too when I was my first float. Actually, you know, just that suddenly. It's like the abyss kind of opens up, yeah. you know, mm. and the sense of like what's beyond my thought and my sense of identifying with who I am in this body. And, um, but then, you know, also experiencing the peace and serenity of that. And um, I think, as you know, psychedelics or entheogens are concerned, that also is a place where we, we learn how to, to kind of think uh, beyond this. Uh, this bag of of bones and um, identification and it's something that is being used therapeutically to help people prepare as well you mm-hmm. know um, so I think that's that's a, an important step for us to take as as humanity is to reckon with our own mortality and that I think will pay into how we consider, you know, our legacies, how we're going to treat future generations, mm-hmm. and how we're going to live, you know, in the present moment, mm-hmm. you know, with a more full sense of um, wanting to make every minute count. You know? Yeah, making every minute count and realizing that no matter how much wealth you accumulate in your life, you definitely can't take it with you. You know, so you spend all your working, all your you, the prime of your life working towards making enough money so you can sustain yourself when you get older mm. um and then realizing that that's all gonna leave anyways it's all impermanent you know yeah. whereas if you had that you know potentially multi-generational household well you work for a little bit you support the family for your time but then when your time is over well you have a support group there for you taking care of you when you get older and sick and you can't work essentially mm-hmm. you know yeah and it's kind of going back to that uh uh, talking about death and I had this little thing that I kind of thought of uh, one time and and I mean it's obviously easy, easily de- debatable but uh, and when you're talking about meditation and, and you know floating even and having that sense of um, just confronting your mortality potentially from like a void experience or whatever but so I was like yoga also can mean union you know, union with the self, union with the whole, whatever. It's, it's an aspect of union. And I kind of put it as like yoga 1.0 is like the physical asana. And then yoga 2.0 is kind of like meditation and pranayama. And uh, yoga 3.0, I said, was like floating, taking that to maybe another level. Yoga 4.0 was psychedelics. And then yoga 5.0 was death. And like mm. the ultimate union, and like how all these things can, um, I mean, and, and you don't have to put them in a hierarchy or a, a linear fashion like that. But well, one could be just as impactful as the other. Correct. Right? Yes, yeah. that's right. But you know what I mean. But that's how I looked at like, like being dealing with your death and and coming to terms with it. that is the forced union of the life cycle. You know, like you, whether you're ready for it or not, uh, personally, it will happen. You will. You will unite yeah mm-hmm. and um you know so that's and i i had an, another really, really cool story i was in sri lanka traveling and i was speaking with um a yogi there a guy that i did some classes with and he was telling me about how his father died and his father was a pretty i guess spiritual man and practiced a lot and different i don't know he didn't get into the details of his practice but 
um, on the day that he was dying, he called his family in around his bed and kind of just individually was able to say goodbye to them. And then he just did like, okay. I mean, this is obviously um, out of context, but he's just like, okay, I'm going to go now. And he just closed his eyes and left. And that was it. And it just, it just really impacted me as well about having that much... I mean, one to be that conscious at your death, obviously, but just to be able to control it without any fear or anything like that, and to just just step aside and, and let it let it happen, let it go. I thought that was just beautiful, whether it was true or not. I'm like, that was, that was a beautiful little story, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and I assume, like you know, when you wear a shirt like yours, decolonized and indigenized, you don't necessarily are implying that we're going to go back to this tribal archaic community but you're expressing the ideas of let's, let's bring indigenous there are there are good lessons that we can learn in our culture today and bring that into a contemporary form and i think that's what we're talking about or i mean it's an impactful shirt can i can you talk about it a little bit yeah this is uh made by a filipino filipino american um who does this project called pre-filipino pre-filipino being um a connection with the Filipino is a colonization um, derived term from from the Philippe, Philippe, Philippe of Spain who colonized the Philippines. But before that, it wasn't called the Philippines. So, right. um, so there's this whole uh, movement going on within especially the diaspora of, of Filipinos who have gone from the Philippines and are living all over the planet, um, who are drawing upon their um, indigenous ancestry, which um, predates colonization. The Igorut, is that right? Yeah, that's that's a, a term for the indigenous, and um, you know, in a lot of ways that was you know similar to what has happened here on Turtle Island, and um, where you know people were separated from their ancestral lineage the matriarchal lineage was killed off or um etc so uh the message of of decolonization is as we live here in this uh this colonized society decolonization is like looking at how we can um, not re no, not return exactly to this sort of tribal way of living per se, but how we can look at our um, the uh, the privileges we have gained as a result of colonization, which are also contributing to some of the destructive practices. So how can we undo some of those things, and how can we um, uh, put that check that privilege and put it towards you know being in right relationship with um, things that are still being perpetuated as, you know, things like the, the, um, the continued plunder of, of lands and resources and that kind of thing. How can we stand in allyship and um, considering whole other scenario where, you know, instead of identifying perhaps as like Canadian, which is really, you know, if you really deconstruct that, that's a corporate term that, you know, it's kind of a collective brainwashing that's gone on. It's an illegal takeover and <clears throat> putting a historic lens on things and understanding I am, you know, here through the circumstances of colonization and th there's this opportunity right right now to help preserve the future of this land by being in support of those indigenous people that are still working to protect it you know just as they always have um so i can you know perhaps personally tr place more trust in that that kind of governance than i can in my own canadian leadership Mm -hmm. you know, like yeah, it's uh, it's coming to that point where it's it's becoming really black and white in, in a way. Well, Terence McKenna said, you know, and it, I mean this is an extreme comment, but we are led by the least among us, and uh, just referring to and and he I think he was referring more to um, 
yeah, well, just the ignorance of people who are the leaders and, and you know, and, and he always would talk about the, the psychedelic experience and how that uh, can, can shift people's perspectives in such a way to, uh, to see their, the programming that they've been kind of born into and, and um, exposed to. And that's, uh, that is the, one of the main, per well, there's lots of applications, but that's a, a definitely a potency of the tool of, of a entheogenic or psychedelic experience is to just, it just re like, you know, pauses that programming for a while to let you see it from a different angle. And, um, yeah, you know, so. Well, I know for a lot of people, when they have that expansion and they see like, oh, there's so much more I could be doing with my existence. And then they suddenly feel like they, what's been lacking in, in my life, and I, I'd say this holds true for so many of us uh, in this culture, is that you know, if we come from a place of everything's self-serving and trying to you know, be for, for the individual, yeah. then that leaves this whole other uh, <clears throat> part of ourselves, which I think is what makes us human, that wants to give. You know, we just had Thanksgiving, and so there's like this like really more like thanks taking you know and you know where's the giving part and you know getting into that spirit is what brings us back into our humanity brings yeah. us back into our sense of like this is what i'm here for mm -hmm. and uh i think if if it's plant medicines that do it if it's a near-death experience that does it if it's having a child suddenly does it anything that causes us to think beyond the bubble of like my own person my own yeah. interest so if you could, if you had a magic wand and you could wave it and change whatever it is that you wanted to change, what would that be and what would that look like? Um, I mean, I could answer that many different ways. I guess the one that's coming to mind is, I guess, um, our, our way of using economics, you know, towards the the personal gain at the expense of everyone else. You know, why not an economics that considers, you know, the the benefit of all? You know, let's get Vulcan with our economics. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let's, you know, try to, um, so like you, you said a magic wand, so, you know, I'm thinking on that big level, but mm -hmm. that would be, you know, maybe what I would say is like, if, if we're all so attached to money, let's make it move in the direction that's actually going to make it of benefit to everyone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, and you, you, have a, you said, um, yeah, you have a couple events coming up. Um, can you elaborate on those? Where are they and like, how can people yeah, get I more information? Yeah, I mentioned the, the nearest uh, event would be on October 22nd at 8 till 10 p.m. Eternal Abundance. It's, uh, Eternal Abundance, and it's uh, the one of the lead-in events to sort of set the tone and, and stir the dialogue up about uh, the topics relating to spirit plant medicine. And um, also this coming week on the 24th, which is also my birthday, cool. um, the Just Dance uh, Journeys, um, which happens over at the uh, Russian Community Center, in uh, Kitsilano, it's on West Fourth, right? West Fourth yeah. is um, is doing a astrology-based um, dance journey for the, uh, the start of the Scorpio season. Mm -hmm. So we're going to be doing a journey through the Scorpio archetype. So it's kind of a an, a new experiment in in uh, what's been happening there, but it's going to be a, a really cool ex way to learn more about the Scorpio archetype um from it's more transformational um, is it a approach. show or is it like a, a dance like for there'll, there'll everybody? be a my friend juniper quinn is going to be facilitating and leading us from the archetype of the scorpion into the eagle and the phoenix cool. and um so that's then and then uh also on the 26th um through the evolver network um I'm also putting on an event with a good friend of mine and former classmate, uh, Leo, Leah Saloma, and uh, 
doing this thing called Gaia voice. And so it's connecting with the natural cycles and our natural voice. Um, so whether you're an experienced singer or a, a new singer or a person who feels blocked in their singing, it will be a really beautiful way to um, connect with the season and with our, our natural rhythms through voice. Um, and those are the most immediate ones that come to mind that I can reference for now. Great, so it's the 22nd at Eternal Abundance. Uh, it's the pre-conference to the Spirit Plant Medicine. The 24th is at the, the Russian Dance Center, or Art Center, Performing Arts at the West 4th Kits, which is the, uh, the Scorpio induction dance session. And then on the 26th, you have uh, the Evolver um, event happening. So. Yeah. I guess if people want to get in touch with you, Facebook is a way for now, and you're Sobe Wing on Facebook. Um, yeah, I do have else? a Tumblr uh, thing, but if you just Google my name, cool. um, you'll find stuff. And yeah, I join Evolver Vancouver on um, on Facebook. Uh, we will er eventually uh, have a, a larger site for the whole Evolver Spore Network because it's not just a local thing; it's a it's a global thing. Cool. And um, yeah. All right. Excellent. Awesome, man. Well, thank you so much for coming on. It was a thank you. great conversation. Yeah. Very interesting. Um, thank you, Omid, for yeah. uh, behind-the-scenes work. Always appreciate it. And uh, thanks to Float House uh, for making this all happen. And uh, that's about it. Anything else from you, big guy? No, I think we're good for now. Cool. Until next week. This is uh, qu quite the psychedelic week on uh, Vancouver Real. I Gabor see. Mate. And potentially, well, Dennis McKenna last night was kind of cool. So. Yeah, yeah, he was he was a very interesting talk. We saw him at um, Banyan Books, which was uh, it was just cool to hear him talk about his life and some Trek stories. into the jungle, eating mushrooms. Yeah, basically. Yeah, and come by the Urban Shaman on a t yeah. uh, Wednesday or a Sunday early in the day, and I'm always there to chat about these kind of things there as well. Cool, awesome. Urban Shaman, that's on Hastings Street, right? Three hundred seven West Hastings. There you go. Thanks everyone for joining us this week and we'll see you next time. Until then, to whatever is. To whatever is.